Good morning. We are glad that you're here. Oftentimes when we see somebody we've not seen for a while, or maybe just every day, we say some kind of a greeting. And even when uh, we say goodbye, a lot of times uh, we may come up with a, uh, some kind of a greeting. And that was not uncommon even in the first century. If you remember, a lot of times Paul, as he's writing his letter, would begin with a grace and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's trying to offer them more than just a, a hi or a salutation, but he's offering them something that's real and something that he had hoped that they would have. And so even back then, today, a lot of times the Jewish people in their coming and their going would greet one another with shalom, uh, which means peace. It really has to do with inward peace. It's not really necessarily peace on everything on the outside because we know we're never going to achieve that. But maybe we can have peace inside regardless of the things that are happening in our surroundings, in our life, maybe at our job, or our school, just wherever it is. We're going to have trials, tribulations, conflicts, and struggles. And could there be peace that we can still have on the inside of our life? And uh, maybe many years ago, uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, and some of you may remember that, but it seems to be a, a word that's coming out more now, kind of as you're saying goodbye, uh, peace out. Um, and I don't really know what that means. But one idea is, hey, if I have peace on the inside, then that peace will show up on the outside. It will come out in who I am. So if you're going to have peace on the outer side, you've got to have peace on the inner side. So it's not just trying to control, you know, our, our habits or our, say, our sayings or our words or our actions. But if we really are peace people, because we've been changed by Christ, we have something to offer the world. So we are, I think everybody in the world is searching for peace, wouldn't you say so? I mean, don't you think a lot of people are going, uh, sometimes they go to a, a psychologist or a therapist. Sometimes they just talk to a friend. Sometimes even going to a lawyer, even to break off a relationship. Why would you do that? Because I'm in search of peace. So we know in the world there's going to be a lot of struggles. There's going to be a lot of turmoil, and it comes from many different places, and here we are thinking that as Christians, we're going to have peace in every aspect of our life. And the fact is, we're not. Like even Jesus, you know, and Phil was saying that when, when he was talking about the Lord's Supper, right? The things that Jesus went through. Like Jesus was the perfect person. He's the one who loved. He was kind. He was helping people. He was serving you know, you think about what qualities in Jesus' life would you look at and go, I hate that quality. I mean, he's just, that's something I don't like at all. I, you know, I would never want to be like that. I mean, why do people have such a problem with Jesus? Well, no, hang on. I thought he was supposed to be the Prince of Peace. Don't you remember that prophecy back in Isaiah? The Prince of Peace? Where is this peace that everyone talks about? This peace on earth, this peace in the world. I remember growing up in uh, grade school, I was uh, singing in a chorus, uh, not because I was chosen, I think it was like everybody in the class, so you didn't have to be good. Uh, if they were, you know, doing uh, some uh, trials and some auditions, um, I would have been the first to be cut. But evidently, I was still in it. But I do remember, you know, singing that song, Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And so the idea was, yeah, we were looking for this idea of peace on earth. And somehow people think, well, if we can establish the right political system, you know, if we can get people educated, you know, maybe just give them one more class. You know, here's a book to read, and if everyone reads the book, it's going to transform the world. But you know, the, having this peace within, sometimes that's a struggle. So where do we go looking for this peace? What is this promise that Jesus talked about, this peace that he came? You remember, even at his birth, the angel said this about Jesus Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth 
to those on whom his favor rests. Well, there it is right there. Jesus came to bring peace on earth. Well, if you look at it a little closer, it's not exactly what it says. The peace is going to come to the people that are on the earth, but to everyone or just to some people? Well, it says just to some people. Those would be the people on whom God's favor rests. What, what does that mean? Well, if God's favor, his blessing, his peace is going to rest on us, that means we need to be in his favor, which would mean we need to be in a relationship with him. We need to be pleasing to him. So how do you do that? Well, we can't do that ourselves. So a real quick synopsis is that would mean if you're following Christ, you're in a relationship with God the Father, your sins have been forgiven, and you're tr now trying to live as a Christian. But those are the people on whom the favor. This is not some promise of worldwide peace to everyone, even those that reject God, or even those people that even to Jesus would say, crucify him, rid the earth of, we want nothing else, we don't want to hear him again. It's only those people on whom the Lord's favor rests. Uh, yeah, again, you could read through the Old Testament thing, but you know, the Jewish people were waiting for this grand idea of peace. I mean, there was peace in the Old Testament, but it was for a very short time. And even in the peace in Solomon's day, probably not so much peace in David's day. He had a lot of conflict, both internally, uh, inter-family conflict. He still had his enemies. But maybe during the days of Solomon there was peace, but that really was only based because of his power and his wealth and his glory. But it certainly didn't last very long. It was only his next... As soon as he died, we couldn't even decide who's going to rule the kingdom. So here's a great idea. Let's split it up. See how that works. So there's constant struggle for this peace on earth. Where is this to be found? So the Jewish people never found it. Even today in the Middle East, where is there peace? It's been 2,000 years since Jesus said those words. But even the Jewish people today find no peace. They sometimes don't even have peace amongst themselves. They don't have peace with their neighbors. There's conflict. Where is this peace that Jesus speaks of? How do we have that peace? And what did Jesus really mean when he talked about this peace can be yours? Well, the fact is the Bible does say, Jesus does address this topic because he does say, peace on earth. This is the one scripture in the Bible, if you look through the New Testament, saying we're looking for when Jesus talks specifically about peace on earth. Yay, this is it. Uh, it doesn't look too positive, though, does it? Well, he, I didn't come to bring... Who told you I came to bring peace? I came to give you peace. I didn't come to make peace throughout the world. And then he goes on to explain why. Because if you're going to live like Jesus lived, there's a good chance people in the world are going to react to you like they reacted to him. Jesus said, a servant is not, a, not above his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. So even simply living as a Christian, you're going to have trials and struggles and tribulation. But even if we took Christianity out of the equation and we said, okay, if even in places, maybe in homes or in neighborhoods or even in countries, where there is very little or maybe no Christianity, oh, but those people live in utopia. I mean, there's, there's peace everywhere. Oh, really? You know, can you point us to such a place? Well, no, because there's always this struggle. Some people even say this idea of shalom that the Jews used all the time in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word peace, kind of has to do with the idea of may it be in your life as it was meant to be. Oh, that kind of going back to, can you have that same peace 
that God designed in the very beginning with a place called paradise. The Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve. A place before there was what? Sin? Conflict? Enmity? Division? Fighting? Blaming? I hope you find what God had intended your life to be. Which is a life of peace. Sin is the thing that's destroyed it all. But we can find peace in Christ, but it's not necessarily going to produce peace all around us. Here Jesus goes on to say, you want to know something? Becoming a Christian, sometimes these people that are unpeaceable, it should not be you, by the way, you know, He says, Jesus goes on to say, you know, I've come to bring a sword which will cause division. Even against a father and a mother and parent and child and uh, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law. Just even in the local family, division because of Christ. Now, if you are a Christian, that doesn't mean you go home today and cause all kinds of conflict in your family because Jesus said it was going to be that way. You're not causing it. But simply because you are living for Christ, there's going to be some people of even your own family, in your neighborhood, in your job, in your school. They're not going to like the way you live. And they're going to create conflict. They're going to create division. They're going to create trouble. So how do we respond to that? What have we as Christians been called to do? So Jesus is going to kind of explain where this comes from. So we kind of, again, have to look very carefully at the words Jesus speaks. So John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. So this is just before Jesus went to the cross, like literally the day before. The evening, he's with his apostles. Listen, I'm going to leave you my peace. My peace I give you. Now you think about that. How much peace did Jesus have? Again, not everybody was peaceful toward him, but he was peaceful towards everyone. He was patient and kind, willing to forgive, loving. He served people. He healed people. He taught people. He was patient. Yeah, I mean, there were times where where he was strong in his rebuke, But that does not mean he didn't have love, or patience, or peace. Okay, he cleansed the temple. We would say he said some unkind things to the religious leaders, like in Matthew chapter 23 and 24. But he did that in love. He did that for their benefit. He did that because he wanted them to repent. But Jesus never sinned. And the way he treated people was the way of peace. So Jesus is not saying, listen, see if you can develop some peace in your own life. Good luck. Go on out and give it a good try. He's saying, I'm going to give you my peace. How does that happen? Well, for us today, it happens when God gives us the Holy Spirit. Because we could probably ask the kids to come up today and say, what's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy. Anybody know what the next one is? Peace. Where's this peace coming from? You got to develop it. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit lives within us, and we're going to have God's peace in us. You see, Ephesians chapter 4, and Paul does this in most of his letters. By the way, you look at the letters, these, these, you know, what we call um, uh, the epistles, what what Paul wrote to different churches. Now, they had different struggles, but a lot of the churches were divided. They were divided over Jew and Gentile, or maybe the Jews and the Samaritans. They were divided over the rich and the poor. They were divided over the people that were living a righteous life and those who were living immorally. They had false teaching, and they had people that are trying to correct these false teachers. They had all kinds of struggles that caused division even within the church. Paul begins Romans chapter, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, talking about all these divisions. You guys have been divided. You should be united. You should have peace, but you don't have peace. So what about this peace? So Paul is saying, 
This peace comes from God. This peace, Ephesians chapter 4 says, that we are to, some translations say, maintain this peace. The peace of the Spirit. We are not to develop it. We just have to keep it. Keeping the spirit of peace. The bond of peace. It's what the Spirit does as he works through our life. So Jesus is going to give us his peace. And again, that looks like having peace in the middle of a storm. Because that's what Jesus lived through a lot in his life, didn't he? Stormy life, a rocky life, a life of struggles and trials and temptations and difficult people. But Jesus still had peace. That's the kind of peace that's promised to us. And that's when he can say, let not your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Why? Because God's peace will eliminate those attitudes that will eventually destroy us. They'll bring us down if we are always troubled and fearful. We rise above that in the peace of God. So a little bit later on, the this, this same evening when Jesus with, was with the apostles in John 16, I've told you these things so that in me you will have peace. It's in me. It's not found in the world. It's not found in your political system. It's not people that are coming together saying, well, let's make one World government order, and through that, we're going to have peace throughout the world. Oh, you may have people with power. You have may, maybe have people that uh, can abuse authority. But you're never going to have peace. Not with a worldly system. How do we have peace? It comes through Christ. In this world, this is Jesus' promise then, you will have trouble. You'll have struggle. You'll have conflict. You'll have people that don't like you. But then he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus himself has overcome the world, which means what? That means he has conquered sin and death so that we can have victory. Like Jesus didn't say, well, I conquered the world, so therefore everyone in the world is going to submit to me, follow me, seek me, worship me, and find peace in me. Because we know that hasn't happened since the first century. It will happen in heaven. Well, what does this mean then that he has overcome the world? Jesus has all the power and all the authority. And one day we know that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But right now, we still have conflict. So Jesus' peace lives in us. So that even though there's destruction in the world, inside of us, we can still find the peace that comes from Christ. The peace, as Philippians 4 says, passes all understanding. It's just hard to comprehend. Uh, maybe sometimes we've been through some things and we say, I don't know why I still have peace because this is not a very good situation. Just receive some bad news, but I can still have peace. I can still have a lot of uh, things that should cause me great fear and frustration, but I can still have peace. I have a lot of conflict going on on the outside. Inside, I can still have peace because I trust in Christ. So Ephesians 4 talks about not only peace with God, not only peace from within. But don't forget the peace within, because if we don't have it from within, it's not going to come out. Some people that struggle the most with others, it's because they don't have peace inside themselves. The reason they can't live with you is they can't live with themselves. The reason they're fighting with you all the time is because they're always fighting internal battles. There's no peace in their heart. And so they live outwardly a very rugged, divisive life. But when we're in Christ, it changes everything. So here he talks about two groups of people that have been en enemies for centuries. The Jews and the Gentiles. Sometimes even the Jews and the Samaritans. So Jesus said, 
This is Paul speaking about what Jesus has done. Ephesians 2 and 14. For Jesus himself is our peace. This is how we can come together, because of Jesus. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh with the law, with its commandments and regulations. So Jesus has brought us together because we are one in Christ. Because we all equally need Christ. We all meet at the foot of the cross. No one is better than anyone else. Regardless of your age, or your income status, or your zip code, or the sins that you've committed, or maybe the ones that you've omitted altogether. You just, it doesn't matter. We are all in equal need of the Savior. And so we all come with humility and thanksgiving. We come with acceptance of each other because we are all in Christ Jesus. The walls have been broken down. In Ephesians 5, uh, sorry, 2 verse 15, which is the next verse, explains a little bit more of what's going on. This is the purpose. This is why all this has been done, was to create in Christ one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So as a church, we think about how we can be united. There are a lot of things even that can divide us. But us being united is one of the hallmarks, one of the cornerstones people in the world can see in the church, that we are united. We love each other. We serve each other. We humble ourselves before each other. We are together, even though we're so different. Like we could look around and say, well, probably anywhere else, I would not necessarily pick you guys to be on my team or to be my friends, or to be in my family. But here we are. And even though we're different in many ways, what we have in common is so much greater, so much more powerful than our differences. And we come together and we say we are one. We do love each other. We can accept one another. And this is part of the power of our testimony as a church to people that have never read the Bible. They say, what, it is, what is it about these people? What do they have in common that would make them have this kind of unity, this oneness? So we need to think about things that we do and maybe things that we should not do. But how can we continue with unity together? In Romans 12, which Alex read a little earlier, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. How do we live at peace? That's going to be hard, isn't it? And it, it's really saying it's not always going to work because some people don't want peace. Some people don't want to get along. Some people don't want unity. But this is what he's saying. If you're a Christian, you have to say, this is one of my goals. I'm going to live my life that I do not put up a stumbling block. I do not cause the irritation. I do not do things just so I can get my own way or I can grandstand my own idea or so that I can be popular or so that I can be a know-it-all. Well, what am I trying to do? Say, so I just want to love people, to serve people, and I want there to be peace. How does that happen practically in a climate that we have right now in the summer of 2020? There's a lot of things we could do and maybe some things that we should not do. We need to work on how we can promote peace, how we can accept people, how we can love people, how we can come to an understanding, how we can be maybe listeners more than we are talkers. We're willing to maybe even to understand why people struggle with what they struggle with and what they go through. 
And I find, especially in a political climate, so political, what do I mean? Well, we're going to have a, an election in November. Well, that sounds pretty political. Well, some people are saying, should we wear masks or no masks? That can be highly explosively political. Well, we can have a, a movement where we say, you know, we want equality. Now, that can be political as well. So the question is, while we may participate in conversation, and while we may be able to express our opinion, how can we do that without being divisive? Because we could say, let's see if next week I can do a lesson, and you know if I'm not here next week, something went bad, real bad. So by the way, next week, Jason's going to be here preaching, and... <laughs> And he's going to be talking about uh, Panama. So that's already scheduled. So don't think that, you know, the elders... No, the idea, though, is... What I, you know we could get up here and say, let's split this congregation up, Democrat, Republican. Let's split this church up based on, you know, we're going to march for Black Lives Matter and cause mayhem, or we're going to pretend it doesn't even matter. Or we're going to take a big stand on masks and make it political and we're going to divide the church. Do, does anybody think that's a good idea? It's, it's probably not. Here's the thing that I found about Paul, the Apostle Paul. Why, well, maybe one of the reasons he was so effective. Many reasons. He was a hard worker. He, he shared the gospel. But one thing he said is, I don't want to put a stumbling block up. He says, I'm willing to become all things to all people. And so just a matter of practicality for you, for me. Be careful what you say and how you say it, especially when it comes to divisive or political matters. If you're going to say something, make sure it is showered in love and kindness and gentleness when you speak. Do not make it your one ambition in life. If you are going to be communicating through electronic devices, whether it be email, Facebook, any other kind of messaging device, Twitter, Snapchat, I mean, just the list goes on and on of ways you can communicate. Be very careful what you communicate. Even doing things like liking something, commenting on something. Does anybody know that that can be very divisive? I mean, generally, I try to stay out. Sometimes I see things, and I say, that's not even right. Somebody's got to sign up here. It's like, okay, I can do that. And what I can actually do is alienate the person I'm trying to love. And as a Christian, this is what I'm saying about Paul, I don't think he would do it. Because you know what Paul thinks? How can I win that person to Christ? And if I get into a big political spat with him on Facebook, and the next day I say, hey, by the way, you want a Bible study? The reaction would be, I don't want a Bible study right now. But if ever I want a Bible study, you're going to be the last person I'm ever going to ask. Right? Because you're mean-spirited, you're negative, you're a complainer, you're... You know, you think you got to stand on everything. You think you're a know-it-all. So sometimes I just like, oh, i got to say something. But I'm not going to. Why? Because I don't want to ruin my testimony. Now, you may look and say, well, you don't got much of a testimony anyway, but I don't want to lose what little bit I have. Right? Just be careful about how you respond to people. Right? Sometimes it's not worth the battle. So here's another test. If you want to talk about the conversations you have with people, could be people at work, could be people at home, it could be people at church. So people listened in on, on your conversation. Or what you've been emailing and what you've been putting on social media. If somebody looked at the last month of these entries of your life, what would they say? What would they see? What's the conclusion? Well, we know what side of the aisle they stand on. We know they take a political stand. They know what they think of our governor. 
I know what you, th- I th- what you think of, you know, whatever the issue is. But I wonder if somebody said, yeah, but do you think they're a Christian? Do you think they love Jesus? They talk about a lot of stuff. Not a Christian. Never saw one post. No interest. No comment. Ever about Jesus. Is that a good testimony? Like, could you imagine Jesus being like that? We don't really care about Jesus, right? Really? Oh, you know... Yeah, Jesus may do that, but, you know, we don't want to be radical. Right? I, I'm not saying you've got to talk about Jesus every... I'm not saying every Facebook post has got to be about Jesus or every conversation has to be about Jesus. But are any? And if they're not, all it reveals is you love politics, you love conflict, you love science, you love history, you love making up things, or maybe even passing along things that are just simply... Lies? Well, hang on. If I'm passing along lies, stuff that I've not even looked to see if it's even true, and I'm just passing it along, let me ask you, what does that do to your testimony? We've got to be careful. Because we can cause so much division. That's all we're talking about, how we can cause division. And Paul's saying, I just want to cause unity. I want to bring unity. I want to bring people together. I don't want to figure out how I can cause more isolation. And how I can humiliate people that think differently than me. And I just say, I want to love them. Yeah, they're different, but that's okay. We can learn, we can discuss, and we can grow together. Romans chapter 14 and verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Paul's, I think Paul's saying it's what I'm trying to do. Paul's saying this is what I want you to try to do. I'm talking to the Roman church. But he's talking to us too. Make every effort. Not a little bit. Not once in a while. Not when I feel like it. Even when things really irritate me. Make every effort to do things that bring peace, build people up, that encourage people, that make people stronger, that bring people closer to God. This is God's plan for us. As we shine like stars in a dark world and as we try to bring the peace of Christ to other people in a world that's so divided. So we're going to sing a song, It Is Well With My Soul, and we always offer an opportunity for people that... Maybe you've never accepted the peace of Christ, never lived the peace of Christ, that are still living in a divided world because they have a divided heart. They live in a place of conflict because there's so much conflict and there's no rest inside their soul, inside their heart, or even in their mind. But that peace is available through Jesus Christ because he lived and he died and he rose again. And if today you want that new start, a new way of living, a new hope, a new peace that comes through Christ, and of surrendering your life completely to him, if you want to be baptized today and into the name of Jesus Christ so that you can be born again, we'll give the opportunity and invitation. We're going to remain seated, and Joe's going to come up and lead us in this song, It Is Well With My Soul.